going to do something a little different today. Uh, we're going to go over uh, how to do 3D printing. Uh, so we're going to start with resin because that's what I'm planning on using. Uh, the only thing you have to understand from a mechanical standpoint with resin printing is either the machine works or it doesn't. All variables are done within the programs that you're going to manipulate the model. So unlike with filament printing where there's a lot of stuff to kind of upkeep and tune and, and level and everything, the physical aspects of a resin printer are you level the base plate, however your machine chooses to do it. Uh, for a lot of machines, you'll only ever level it once every month, if that. Um, my machine uses a four bolt system, meaning it's got four bolts, two on each side of the plate. So it generally doesn't need to be leveled once you've got it done once. It's very secure. Other ones use a ball and socket, most commonly the Elegoo products. Those can slip a bit, especially when taking prints off the plate. Uh, you can kind of bang around the level at that point, and so it needs to be checked. Uh, other than that, you have a up and down your Z rod or Z screw, as people call it. That needs to be lubricated every now and then, but there's no actual settings that you need to adjust within the printer itself. Everything's done within the software. Uh, for our purposes, I'm using Cheeto, uh, Cheeto Box. This is the free version of their software. Unfortunately, with a lot of newer machines, you have to do at least the, what's called the slicing in Cheeto Box because the boards are hard coded to only accept files from it. Now, you can use other programs to manipulate the file, uh, which is when you want to apply supports and stuff like that, then export the file and just slice it. But we're going to kind of cover everything within uh, Cheeto Box here. Uh, and we're going to be using our bus. So I'm going to be using the supported files from Nuka World, so we don't have to worry about uh, doing supports. And we're just going to kind of cover the basic slicing. So we can see we got a lot of different pieces, back or the damaged back, the front. I actually have the bench in here for some reason. Uh, damage, damage the doors. Driver's chair, so this is like all the, oh, bench would be the internal benches, I'm guessing. Uh, okay. Sometimes they have a larger version of it, uh, as, but looks like we're going to have to combine it after printing. So we're going to open up the back. And so here you can see this is a very large file. So I have a very large printer. Uh, when you set up Cheeto Box or any other thing, you're generally going to have a settings option somewhere. Uh, for Cheeto Box, it's very simple. It's right here. And you go in and you add your printer. Cheeto Box is nice in that it has a listing of printers. So I have an Epax E10 5K. So you can see I've already got that set up. So that means it comes in and it's pre-set up with what my resolution is, uh, what my build plate size, and then under resin, uh, this is for monetary purposes. You can tell it how much your resin costs per liter, and then it's going to give you an approximation of a printing cost. But this is where, this is all the information. Uh, and what I do, I use uh, EPAX as resin along with it, their machine just because it's easier. Um, they're 30 minutes down the road from me, so I generally get a really quick delivery. Um, and they have a listing on their website as to the settings for their resin. So that's what all of this is pulled from. Now, that's not to say that it's going to work 100% of the time. There are some basic things that you need to adjust sometimes. So if you're having prints that aren't adhering to the build plate, for instance. So I swapped my build plate from the standard one to a smaller one and applied a magnetic surface to it. So it has uh, the build plate with magnet uh, surface adhered to it, and then a steel plate that goes on that. That did require some manual calibration on the machine, but it's a real simple adjustment of a physical uh, sensor adjuster. Um, 
whatever machine you get, if you ever have to do that, there should be instructions with it. Uh, but that new build plate isn't quite, it doesn't have the same adherence properties as the old one. So I had to, yeah, I was dropping models. Basically, the model wouldn't adhere to the plate and you just have a, bunch, a patch of resin left on the uh, FEP of the vat itself. So what I had to do was I adjusted this bottom exposure time from 20 seconds to 25 and bumped the layer count up from the recommended six to eight. And what this is, is the layers are the individual slices of the machine. So when printing with resin, what's happening is your build plate lowers and comes into contact with the bottom of your vat of resin. The bottom of the vat of resin is an FEP or an NFEP. It's basically a chemical plastic sheet that through the magic of science that I don't know, um, when it works, allows the UV light to pass through it, cure the resin on the opposite side, but it resists the adhesion of the resin and allows it to bond to the plate instead of the FEP itself. So then when the plate goes up, it pulls the resin that's solidified on it. And when it goes back down and allows that next thin layer of liquid resin under and it repeats the process, it'll constantly bond the resin to the previous layer. So with resin printing, you're printing from the bottom of the plate up, hanging upside down. Uh, so that's the important thing to remember when you're analyzing these sorts of things. So the bottom layer count is simply put the number of bottom layers that the bottom exposure time will apply to. And you'll see that that 25 seconds is a lot higher than the three seconds that we have for the regular exposure time. So it's making a solid, hard, secure layer to begin with. So if you have problems with models dropping, those are the things that you want to adjust. If you have problems with, say, splitting in the model itself where like the layers are not adhering and you have like almost cracks or peels, that's when you would go in and start adjusting your regular exposure time. And I generally don't touch the lift distances. So this is how high up it goes, how fast it goes up. Um, the only other thing I ever play with is your layer height. So that's the size of the individual slices. So I'm at 0 0.05 millimeter, which is standard for a resin. I could actually drop this lower, but for printing a large bus, I will not be because I don't want to be here for days. As it is, this will probably be a very long print. Uh, the other important thing to remember with resin printing, it doesn't matter how many things you put on the build plate. The only factor for the time is the height of the model itself, because it's all about those individual slices. But yep, so that's just a little quick uh, overview of the settings. So what I'm going to look at, uh, it's too big to go. So we're going to slide it over. So those initial lines are going to be on this kind of patchwork, uh, underside before it hits the model itself, which is good. Hmm. I've never seen someone use that instead of an actual solid base. We'll have to see how that comes out. Let's see if we can actually fit the front at the same time. Like I say, probably, nope. And the other thing with this is by default, it selects everything. So, so let's see, put that there. Uh, the front is a little smaller, but I doubt it will fit. So you can manipulate your files, rotate them, do all kinds of fun stuff. Make sure you grab the right rotation. Oh, we are just going to be able to fit this. Maybe. Let's see. So we're looking for any red as it goes outside the build plate. So you can see there that red starts to come in. So actually, oop, I kind of, did I not get this? Yeah, uh, I accidentally did not rotate it. There we go, flattened it by face, so it's now fully flattened. All right, so now we don't care about the fact we've added this piece because it's not gonna add to the amount of time. 
Unlike with uh, filament printing or FDM printing, where the nozzle itself is physically moving all over the plate, that it, when you add stuff to that, it adds time. This, it's all you know just height based. All right, let's see what else can we add. So we've got the back and the front. I'm not sure how many benches I'm going to need. I don't need the the roof. I don't need the. I do need the doors. Let's see what that looks like. Actually, I need the roof. But I don't, I see a damaged roof. Damaged roof back, let me guess, because it's alphabetical, yep. Let's see how big these roof sections are. Not that bad at all, actually. So let's, we don't want to, the only real factor in whether or not I can put a bunch of stuff on this is the amount of resin that fits in my tank. Uh, I generally can fit around 400 milliliters because the plate I have in it is much lower profile than the standard one. Before I was getting two, 250, something like that. So just need to know how much resin your your particular vat will actually hold because you, um, you can actually pause mid printing and add more resin but it leads to a lot of times you'll have a line where that happened when i printed my uh, fallout ufo that's why i had a line in it it's because of filling the vat uh and let's see that was back so we want the front we're just going to put, so I think that's enough for now. So, you know, that's basically going to give us the entire bus minus the interior and the detail pieces. And this is all the tallest, largest parts as well. So we only have to print the long time once. So now we're going to slice. What slicing is, is it goes in and chops the model into individual lines based on that 0 0.05 that we programmed it. So like I can take this and kind of scroll down and you can see this is what you would use to analyze it for accurate supports. So if I just hit the slice button on this, and this is where it winds up taking the most time. This would seem to take up a lot of resin just based on the size, but because the bus is actually hollow inside, you're not going to use too much. I'd say this is going to be under 200 milliliters. Let's see. All right, so Chai Box, once you finish slicing, gives you all this information, and it also allows you to review your layer height some more. Uh, so it's going to tell you how much milliliters it used. So 250. So I can definitely fit that in a full vat. It's also going to tell me the price based on those details I put into the settings before. So it's telling me that you know 250 out of a uh, one a thousand milliliter bottle. Yeah, I'm using you know about 11 bucks to make this thing, uh, and it's going to take 10 hours to print because it's huge. <laughs> now I'll, I'll reorientate and show how to support. This is obviously supported for a tall machine. Um, most machines do have more height than they have width with resin simply because it's easy to build vertical height into them. Uh, and so like a Mars 2 will be able to print this, but only one piece at a time or, you know, probably both uh, roofs at, at once. But the front and back halves can probably only be printed by themselves simply because of the size of the plate. So from here, I can go ahead and save it. And it's just like any other saving. Uh, and you'll save it to a removable drive, which I will just pop into my machine at some point. Um, 
I generally shorten my file names. A lot of printers have problems with long file names. So I'm just calling this bus one. And for now I'm saving it in the same uh, folder as the STL files. And it's saving it as a CTB file. So this is chai 2 boxes proprietary file. And it's the file type that's accepted on all new boards. Uh, so this is why you have to go through that slicing there. Now it looks like it's saved, but it doesn't. Again, it's going to have to come down here and it's telling you it's going to write the file. Um, and so it just, it's going to take it a long time because this is a large file. All right. So now we're going to kind of go over some rough how to support models. So we're just going to load in one of the unsupported pieces. So what we have to look at when we're doing supports is the connection points that the supports leave can be rough. So we obviously want them to appear in sections where it's not going to show up as much. So in this case, we're going to want it on this flat section. Now, we could pr technically print this flat to the plate. Uh, we could just flatten it out on there. Uh, the problem being with that is... You can kind of see this is a rather large, solid chunk of resin there. So you can create a lot of weight and pull it off the plate pretty easily. Now, also, since this is a fairly solid piece, we're going to go ahead and hollow it first before we do any orientating. So in chai Two box you have the hollow function. So you go in here, you set your wall thick thickness. Um, and whether you keep you know, and the process generally i keep this at default so i'm just going to tell it to go and as we can see the wall thickness is such that it's not hollowing out certain parts just getting that large central cavity is what we really worry about Now we're going to need to punch some holes in this because we don't want any trapped resin causing cracks in these large areas. And I've made some fairly large holes here so you can set the size, etc. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of punch. You want two holes. That way it uh, has a way of getting your cleaning solution in and out of it in order to take care of that. Now. The other thing to think about is shearing forces. So as it raises, we want to make sure that we're not causing uh, undue stress on the model that could pop it off of supports, which is one of the reasons that uh, you tend to see things angled. So I'm going to go ahead and rotate this. And actually, first I need to... Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. Turn off the hole before I start putting holes where I don't want them. I'm going to rotate it this way on the build plate. And then thinking about how I want supports, I don't want supports hitting the outside of the bus. So I'm going to do a complete flip of it such that supports will only go. And looks, yeah, we need to straighten that out. And there we go. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead. Yep. Oop. This can be a little finicky sometimes. Uh, we are aligned on that axis. Good. And as we saw in the pre-supported version, generally higher supports are good. So, because what's going to happen, we can kind of look here and see as the machine goes up, it's going to start at the bottom and print and print and print. So your supports are going to be on that side and also on those edges because wherever a support, a piece appears, you need to have something under it. So you can kind of use this slider tool to look at and make sure that you're always going to have something connected to it. So it's really when you come to the back here that that's going to be a problem internally. Now, when applying supports, there's a couple things to note. Uh, 
So this is set up to have a raft, which uh, you generally need a raft for the supports to adhere to. Also, you see this is the distance that it's coming up off the plate. You don't want it to have a huge distance because you don't want those initial supports to have to you know, reach up too far before the model starts and the drag actually begins. Now, I actually do use the automatic support function within chai uh, Most of these programs, if not all of them, have a function similar to this. I've heard Lychee is better. What I don't do is rely on the auto supports entirely. So I've adjusted a lot of these settings based on various research I've done online. Uh, I'm not going to go over them simply because there's, there's way too much. You can kind of see, you know, the contact shape is how does it connect to the model. Diameter, how big is the contact point? That'll determine how much damage is left behind when you pull it off. As well as the depth, so how deep into the model are you going? Uh, and we're using cones. This lets us know the upper diameter we want, you know, you can see there. I do like these little graphical improvements there. And then connection length. So you can mess with these and do your own manual. So I, but I generally, I start with medium and I just do a plus all. And it's just going to go in there and automatically generate supports where the program thinks based on this densities and angles and stuff where it should be. So we can see we've got some going up into the hollow section. That's pretty normal. It, it seems to be fairly standard. These here are going to leave some marks behind, but that's the bus interior. So again, we don't care. We're only really worried that the, all of the exterior parts that we're going to be really painting and worried about detail look good. Now, a lot of times what I'll now go in and do, because I want to make sure that this doesn't separate, so I'll go in and on this initial kind of section connection piece, I'm going to add some heavy supports. So this just kind of give me a greater connection. You know, I want to make sure that we're not going to pull the model off of the supports as we're doing anything. So just a few added there along that initial connection. And then I'm also going to go ahead and just add a few here and there. Again, we're just trying to make sure that nothing untoward is going to happen. Then I'm going to go in and also add some heavy supports because again, this is the bottom of the model, so it's not going to be seen. But these are just here for me to feel better about it not separating. So then we would just go back here, slice the model, save it as we did with the other one, and go from there. It's a pretty simple process. Um, you can generally rely on auto supporting for a start, but like I said, don't let it be the be all and end all of your attachments. Go in you know, manually add some, you know, look at where your supports are going to wind up and decide how you want to go from there. So now we're going to take the file that I saved earlier and we're going to go ahead and load that into the printer and I'll show you how to, how I fill the resin into the printer and how we kick off a print job. All right, so as we can see, here is my printer. This is my Epax E10 5K variant. All printers are basically the same, as I said before. You've got your Z-axis. You'll see this is loose. That's because we've got a rail system. Others may have a uh, top piece locking that in, just if it doesn't. And I've got my bill plate here. I've already leveled it. This is a little thing I picked up. It's actually a filter. So it's helping to control the odor. Now, as you can see, I've loaded my stick in the side. And they all pretty much use the same console here. So to begin with, I'm going to load some more resin. So I'm going to go under tools, manual, this is for shifting, and tell it to go to home. This is going to lower the build plate into the resin vat. And the reason I do this is my vat doesn't have a max fill line. And even if it did, that's for the old build plate. So now that it is submerged, I'm going to go ahead and add some extra resin just to be sure. 
So I'm just going to pour this in. Generally, I pour it up to there. So I haven't completely maxed it out, but I know that that's around 400 or so milliliters. So that should cover our 250 milliliter job. So now I'm going to raise it up again. I'll actually help mix in. It's also important to let it settle once you pour resin in. So I won't actually be kicking off the print job right now, but I will show you how. So we would go under print, locate the file. Normally the most recent files are on the first page. Select it. And then I'm just going to hit play. And you'll see it has a little preview of what we're looking for as well. So I'm going to let this settle, hit print, and then uh, next week we should have some finished pieces to start with.